Um, the agenda for this presentation, uh, I'm going to start with providing sort of a motivating example. Uh, so basically, try to illustrate the issues that we uh, attempt to address with conformal prediction and the, basically the problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, then we'll, we'll go into just a very general overview of what conformal prediction is and sort of what it does for us and how it answers uh, the, the problems uh, illustrated by the motivating example. Uh, we'll spend quite a bit of time uh, on, on section three here where my idea is to start from a sort of uh, bottom up uh, approach and, and trying to develop an intuition for why does conformal prediction work in the first place? Like what's the basic mechanism at work? Uh, and then we use uh, the knowledge about those mechanisms to design regression and uh, classification models using our conformal prediction framework. Uh, finally, we'll, we'll um, discuss a little bit about uh, sort of the assumptions that go into conformal prediction and uh, how we tend to evaluate conformal predictors. Uh, and of course, some, some concluding thoughts in the end. Um, so we'll start here with the motivating uh, example. And again, if you happen to see uh, one of my presentations before, maybe you'll even recognize this example. I tend to use either this one or a few different ones depending on my mood. Uh, but today, uh, the sort of premise for our example here is that we're in uh, some sort of drug development scenario. Uh, we have some new drug candidate uh, that we want to sort of assess uh, statistically before actually synthesizing the compound and doing uh, lab testing, uh, basically. Um, and specifically, we want to estimate the toxicity of this particular compound uh, using uh, data rather than uh, experimentation. Uh, and of course, at our disposal, we have, first of all, some set of his historical, uh, uh, historical observations. Uh, and in machine learning terms, this is, of course, just your uh, sort of typical uh, training set. So we have our X's and our Y's with, of course, the X's being some kind of uh, numerical description of a particular compound. Uh, while that's interesting in its own right, uh, won't go into details how that numerical representation actually looks, but might be something uh, describing, for instance, the, the atoms that are contained in the molecule. Uh, and of course, given a particular compound, we also have some measurement of the toxicity of that compound in our database of historical observations. Uh, and again, we're, we're of course simplifying here, uh, but for this example, let's say that we can either just assign the label safe or toxic to a particular compound. So it's either toxic or, or, or non-toxic essentially, uh, or perhaps we can sort of grade the toxicity on some scale from zero to one, zero being completely non-toxic and uh, one being essentially a very deadly toxic. Uh, and in, in addition to this data, of course, we have access to some machine learning algorithm. Uh, and here we'll, we'll be looking at classification and regression algorithms uh, specifically. And of course, if you've done any uh, work whatsoever with machine learning, uh, it's sort of obvious how you might approach this problem with a first attempt. Uh, it might look something like this, where uh, we uh, choose some uh, classification uh, algorithm, in this case, a, a K neighbors classifier. Uh, we train our classification model based on our training data. And then we make a prediction for our test object. So this compound uh, Kx plus one uh, is our test, uh, x test here. Right? And then we get some output from our model, which is our, based on the data that, or the historical data, our model's best guess for the toxicity of uh, our new test compound. 
Uh, and in this case, let's say that, for instance, our classifier outputs the label safe. Uh, or uh, maybe if we want slightly more information, we don't just uh, ask the, the, the model for the most likely class label, but instead we ask it for some probability uh, or class probability estimates. Uh, so maybe we'll get something that looks like, well, it's 80% uh, likely that the compound is safe and 20% likely that the compound is toxic. Uh, and maybe that's all well and good, um, but now we ha actually have to ask ourselves uh, some fairly tough questions. Um, well, first of all, our classifier says that this compound is safe. And of course the question is, is it really safe? Is the model correct or is the model uh, wrong, essentially? Um, or in the, in the other case where we had uh, not just the most likely class label, but instead some kind of probability estimate where we, our model said that it's 80% likely that the compound is safe. Well, how good is that 80% as an estimate? Uh, because it's not a true probability, it's only a probability estimate. So how close is that, is that uh, estimate to uh, reality? And if we imagine that we had the case where we could actually grade toxicity on a numerical scale, and we instead of classification model built a regression model, uh, maybe our model would tell us that the compound has a toxicity level of 0 0.4. And then again, the question is how close is that to the true toxicity value of this particular compound? Uh, and the sort of question that we're really trying to get at here is, are we going to trust our model? Uh, are we essentially willing to go in the footsteps of Alexander Fleming and uh, ingesting a sample of our compound in the belief that it's not going to be harmful to us. Uh, and of course, this is, this is not a new uh, question by any means. This question is probably older than uh, machine learning uh, as a subject even. Uh, so we already have some at least tentative answers uh, to this question. And of course, uh, the simplest answer or simplest form of answer to this question is simply that well, we expect past performance to be a good indicator for future performance, uh, which sort of implies that if we can test our model in some reasonable way and obtain some information about its performance based on data that we already have available to us, we can estimate how well it's going to uh, perform on data that we will uh, receive in the future essentially. So we have a case that looks something like this, right? So uh, maybe we measured the accuracy of our classification model. That accuracy turned out to be 80% on some uh, set of test data that we withheld from our model during training. Uh, so we're, we're going to assume that it's 80% accurate on also on production data. Or maybe we're looking at different kinds of uh, metrics, whatever we're interested, uh, uh, area under curve for a, a probability estimation, uh, estimating model, or uh, maybe the root mean squared error for a regression model. But this sort of overall form of this assumption that we're making is the same. We measure something on the test data and we assume that uh, that's going to hold also for our production data. Uh, but now we haven't really solved or addressed the problem, we've sort of just moved the problem forward in a way because, well, previously we had to ask ourselves, uh, ourselves, how good is the prediction? Now we have to ask how good is the estimate of the model performance? So we still have this sort of weird question that we need to um, address in, in some way, right? Uh, specifically, we might ask, well, do we have any guarantees for how good these estimates are? And in general, we probably don't. Uh, these are just, again, estimates of the model performance. Uh, we're also doing a little bit of almost self-deception uh, here because when we're doing this uh, assessment of the model performance on a test set, uh, we're looking at what's the average performance of the model. Uh, 
uh, which wasn't really the question that we wanted to answer in the first place. We wanted to know how good is the prediction that we're making for our new compound, xk plus 1. And we don't really care so much about how good our model is in general. Uh, we care about our model making a good prediction for this particular compound that we're currently developing. Uh, so, so then we might ask, well, how good do we think that the model is going to actually perform on this particular uh, instance? And in, in trying to tackle these uh, sorts of questions, that's where uh, conformal prediction comes in as uh, a useful helping hand in, in trying to uh, guide you into understanding how much you should actually trust your model and your, your predictions uh, or the prediction that your model makes. So what is a conformal prediction then? Well, and sort of here a disclaimer uh, again, I suppose, uh, we will be taking a slightly limited view uh, of conformal prediction in this tutorial and sort of limit ourselves to classification and uh, regression algorithms, uh, partly due to, to time, but also hopefully uh, the, the sort of intuition that I want to hopefully try, try to provide you with, I think translates better if we you know, try to limit the space of ideas that we need to consider. Um, so in, in this sort of simplified view of uh, what a conformal prediction is or a conformal uh, predictor is, it's uh, conformal prediction is a framework for transforming classification and regression algorithms into what we call confidence predictors. Uh, so we already have a classification model or we already have a regression uh, model and we want to transform that into something else. Uh, and we call that something else uh, a confidence predictor. So what, what are confidence predictors then? Well, as the name suggests, there's some kind of uh, uh, predictive system. Uh, and they have two uh, sort of important distinguishing characteristics compared to your traditional classification or regression model. Uh, the first one uh, being that rather than outputting what we would call point predictions, so uh, a single class label or a single real value, uh, depending on if you're doing classification or uh, regression, we actually get multi-valued output from the model. Uh, so in the classification case, uh, a conformal uh, classifier would output a set of labels, that is some subset of the possible label assignments to a partic particular object. So in this case, where we might have the, the output space red, blue, green, uh, a conformal classifier would output any label set containing zero, one, two, or all three class labels. Um, in the regression case, we output predictions in the form of intervals on the real line. So we might have an in, uh, a prediction that looks something like the interval uh, 0 0.0 to 0 0.19 is the prediction from our conformal predictor. Uh, the second really um, arguably more important characteristic of these uh, uh, confidence predictors is that each of these uh, prediction regions is going to be associated with a measure of confidence. Uh, and this is very much akin to the uh, confidence intervals that you might be familiar with uh, from statistics class. But in, these are in reality uh, 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 prediction intervals, uh, rather, with the confidence assigned to them. Um, and what this means is, given a certain uh, confidence gamma, so some value from zero to one, uh, we can say that the prediction region output by our conformal predictor will, out, will contain the correct output value with probability gamma. So that's really the strength of conformal prediction is that every time we make a prediction, we also get this value gamma uh, together with our prediction. That essentially tells us the probability that the prediction is correct or rather uh, 
the probability that the prediction contains the correct answer. And of course, we might end up in cases where we may get multiple answer, answers, like our prediction is red and blue, or rather red or blue. Uh, but gamma here tells us that with probability gamma, red or blue is going to be uh, the correct uh, class label for our test object. Um, so some other sort of properties of this framework. Well, first of all, we, we really um, attempt to, to address our initial question of how good is my prediction for compound XK plus one. Uh, because a conformal predictor provides error bounds Per, on a per instance basis. So for every prediction I make, I get uh, this uh, confidence measure or essentially a, a, an error bound that's specifically uh, applicable to that particular prediction that I'm making. Uh, and these error bounds or confidence measures are well calibrated, meaning essentially that they correspond with reality, uh, which is unlike, for instance, your, your typical uh, probability estimating model where the probability estimates aren't going to be well calibrated uh, normally. So the numbers, the probabilities don't actually correspond with reality in that case. Uh, in order to make this work, we don't need to know anything about the prior probabilities of our uh, data, uh, sort of, Conditioning on priors is essentially sort of integrated into to the whole process. Uh, so we, we never need to make this uh, explicit in any way. The only requirement that we make is that the data is exchangeable, which is sort of a weaker version of the IID assumption, which is uh, very much standard in, in machine learning. Uh, we're ba basically saying that the data the order of the data uh, won't affect the, the likelihood of making our observations or rather maybe the other way around that given a set of observations, if I shuffle the order of those ob observations, uh, that doesn't affect the, the joint probability of my observations. Uh, I can use this with any machine learning algorithm. So it doesn't really matter if I'm using decision trees or neural networks or whatever sort of fancy uh, model I can think of, I can always do this kind of transformation into a conformal confidence predictor. Uh, we can apply this framework online, offline, or semi-offline. Uh, so we can either work in an offline setting where we sort of create our model once, and then we use that model to make all of our predictions. We can have completely online scenario where we essentially uh, incrementally update our model based on uh, new observations continuously, or we can have something in between, a semi-offline model where we sort of sporadically update the model. Uh, and finally, this whole thing is rigorously proven uh, and relatively simple to implement. And of course, here's, here I have to insert a shameless plug for my own implementation of the framework available uh, under the MIT license on, on GitHub. Um, so now, if we want to try to approach some understanding of uh, how this actually works, then we'll start by, again, trying to develop an intuition for the underlying uh, mechanisms. Uh, and we'll start by assuming that we have some sort of initial components here. So first we have some observation space or some problem space, uh, Z. That's just the Cartesian product between some input space X and some output space Y. So uh, this is uh, again in, in sort of standard machine learning terms, X here is gonna be your input features and Y is gonna be your label space. Um, then we have some probability distribution Q over Z. So we have some reality filter essentially that, that tells us how we can actually uh, sample points 
for uh, examples from Z. Uh, and then finally, we have some function F of Z that takes as its, its input some object from uh, our space Z and returns uh, a number on the real line. And this is this is quite important here because the, the first two bits here, that's something that we're actually, or uh, pretty much always uh, going to assume that we have available to us when we're working with machine learning. We have some, some space of observations or uh, possible observations, and then we have some probability uh, distribution that can generate observations from that space. Uh, but then this, the new thing here is that we have this uh, little function f that again, it takes as its input an object with its label and, and just outputs a number, any number on the real line. Uh, so, and these are really the, the only components that we need to start doing conformal prediction. Uh, and where we might start then is to say that um, we'll, we'll draw some uh, data points or instances from our space Z according to this probability distribution Q. And then we're going to apply this function F of Z to those examples that we drew. Uh, let's say for simplicity, we, we draw four examples from the space z, and then we apply the function f of z to those four points. Uh, so we get four uh, real values. Uh, we'll call these alpha 1 through alpha 4. Uh, and for simplicity, we're just going to assume that alpha 1 is less than or equal to alpha 2, etc. Uh, so again, what we've done was we drew some points from, from space Z according to distribution Q, and we apply the function F of Z to those four points. So we get an image that looks something like this. We have uh, our infinite real line, and then we have four arbitrary values mapped onto that real line, our alpha one through alpha four. Uh, so now we're, we're sort of ready to already start doing interesting things. Uh, our next step is that we're going to take some new data points from our space f of z and then we're going to apply our function to those examples as well and get new uh, alpha values. Uh, and now if we assume that these new samples that we're drawing uh, they're also drawn according to the distribution Q. Uh, then we can estimate the distribution of the output values uh, for, uh, or the, the output values of F of Z for our new uh, examples relative to our initial four alpha values, alpha one through alpha four. Uh, and this looks something like this. So, the, the expectation here is that uh, the probability that uh, any value is going to be less than alpha one is 0 0.2. And the probability that any value falls in between alpha one and alpha two is also 0 0.2, et cetera. And if you need some more intuition here, just imagine drawing a really, really large number of just random numbers. Uh, and then take the, the middle value, the median. And then of course, you're gonna expect that half of or 50% of all future numbers that you draw, they're gonna be less than the median and 50% are gonna be greater than the median. And this is the same principle here. Uh, just so we're working with quantiles rather than just the, the median. Um, and if we have this sort of representation, we can, uh, assert things such as the probability of f of z being less than or equal to alpha 3 is 0 0.6. So what we really have here is essentially uh, an empirical cumulative distribution function uh, represented by these four values, alpha 1 through alpha 4, that tells us the, the ECDF of f of z. Uh, now, if we want to make things a bit more interesting, uh, we'll start by actually deciding what, what this function f of z might be. Uh, 
Uh, and in, in conformal prediction with regression problems, uh, a common choice is just saying that uh, we have some model H. So this is a regression model trained on the problem space that we're interested in. Uh, and we'll let this function f of z just be the absolute difference between the predicted output and the correct output. So that's our function f of z that we're going to work with here. The absolute error function of a prediction made by a regression model. Um, so again, we have this sort of image where we have our uh, alpha values and our probabilities representing uh, an empirical cumulative distribution function. Uh, but now, since we have decided what our function is, we can express instead things like, well, the probability that uh, the absolute difference between our model's prediction and the correct uh, output uh, being less than alpha three is 0 0.6. So now we already are starting to get something kind of interesting here, right? Because now we have, uh, we can express a probability function over uh, the error of our regression model. Uh, but of course, we're not quite there yet. Um, we can also realize or make the assumption that for the first uh, alpha values that we generated, alpha one through alpha four, let's say that we know the inputs, the x's and the y's, the outputs. Uh, so basically these are training examples, uh, which means we can compute this function, uh, h of x minus or yi minus h of x i, since we know both x and y in this case which means we can actually assign uh, concrete values uh, to alpha one through alpha four. So now our, our image looks something like this where we're, we can replace these alpha values with actual proper values. Uh, so now we have uh, our uh, empirical cumulative distribution function uh, with actually instantiated uh, thresholds essentially. So now we can say that the probability that the absolute error of our prediction being less than or equal to 0 0.11 is 0 0.6. So now we can actually uh, be much more specific about the, the error, uh, the magnitude of the error that we were expecting at different probabilities. Um, now for, for a new example, uh, so essentially our sort of compound xk plus one, the object for which we want to make a prediction uh, we're going to know the inputs, but not the output. If we knew the output, making a prediction is not a very interesting uh, uh, task in the first place. So all we know is the input, we don't know the output. Uh, of course, we can still obtain a prediction. So we can assign some value to this uh, h of x uh, variable. Uh, so we had this case where we could express something about the, the absolute error of our prediction, which now looks like this, where we can say that the, uh, the probability that the absolute difference between uh, the output and 0 0.3 being less than or equal to 0.11 is 0 0.6. Uh, and of course, by just sort of uh, shuffling around uh, the values here a bit, we can express this, uh, that the probability that the correct output lies on the interval 0 0.3 plus minus 0 0.11 is 0 0.6. So now we've actually created uh, a prediction interval that tells us uh, the probability that uh, the true correct output value lies within a specific interval. Uh, so how do we actually get to this point uh, if we actually want to sort of construct a proper uh, regression model that can do this for us. Uh, so again, we're, we're gonna start by assuming that we have some things here. We have a training set that we've drawn from this space Z with uh, probability distribution Q. Uh, in addition, we have what we call a calibration set. Uh, so this is just a separate uh, uh, set with labels that's also drawn from uh, uh, Z. Uh, 
and it's an independently sampled from uh, the training set. Uh, so essentially, you can think of this as we have two separately drawn training sets. Uh, one we call the training set and the other we call the calibration set. Uh, and then we have this function f of z, which we tend to call a non-conformity function. Uh, and there you see the tie to the, the name of the framework, of course, the conformal prediction. We use non-conformity functions or conformity functions that are a very integral part of the whole framework. Uh, so we have, uh, again, like I mentioned before, in, in regression, this absolute difference function is uh, fairly standard in, in regression problems. So we have f of z is absolute difference between correct output and predicted output. Uh, and now what we'll do here is we'll start by training a regression model on our training set. So, so we'll sort of instantiate H uh, if in our nonconformity function. Uh, then we'll, given that we know what H is, we can apply the function F of Z onto our calibration set. Uh, so we'll apply the function F of Z on each element in the calibration set and obtain, uh, since uh, the, the size of the calibration set here is Q, we'll have Q uh, non-conformity scores, uh, as we call them, or these alpha values. And what we'll do then is we'll sort these non-conformity scores uh, in descending order. So now we have this image. It's pretty much exactly what we had before, uh, with the only difference being that the, the numbers are in descending order rather than ascending order. We also have uh, this uh, predicted output from h of x, uh, y hat of, of x, uh, as our uh, base prediction for uh, our new test example. And given these things that we know, uh, h of x, and we know this empirical cumulative distribution function, we can again just say the same thing here again, right? And say that the probability that the correct output lies on the interval uh, prediction plus minus a certain threshold is 0 0.8 or 0 0.6 or uh, whatever it might be. Um, so in order to actually then construct a proper uh, regression model, uh, now we'll, we'll assume that we have one set of training data available to us. So what we'll start doing is just divide that data into what we call the proper training set that we use to instantiate H uh, and the calibration set. We train the regression model and we apply all of these, or we apply the, the function F to all uh, elements in the calibration set. And again, we sort these calibration scores or non-conformity scores in descending order. And then when we actually wanna make a prediction with a conformal regression model, we'll start by obtaining the base prediction. So we'll apply H to uh, XK plus one. Uh, we'll choose some significance level epsilon uh, from zero to one. So this is essentially our desired probability uh, or error probability or uh, how much error we will accept in our prediction. Uh, then we'll uh, determine some value S, uh, which is just epsilon multiplied by Q plus one, rounded down to the nearest integer. Uh, and this is essentially the epsilon quantile calibration score or non-conformity score in our calibration set. Uh, so, so this is essentially relates back to our image of the real line with the, the, the values mapped onto it. We find a particular, uh, uh, we find an alpha value at a particular point that we're interested in that relates to epsilon, our desired uh, uh, error probability. And what we find is the, the index of the epsilon quantile nonconformity score. Uh, and then in order to generate the prediction, uh, we do the same thing as before, we'll, where we take the pr base prediction plus minus uh, the alpha value located at that particular uh, quantile 
So we generate our prediction region gamma epsilon k plus one as again the, the base prediction plus minus this threshold alpha of s. And what's naturally interesting about this prediction then is that the probability that the correct output value lies on this prediction interval is going to be one minus epsilon. So here, uh, y minus, uh, one minus epsilon is our uh, confidence gamma in the prediction. Um, and that's it really for, for, for creating a, a regression conformal predictor. Uh, if we want to look into different types of uh, models, we might look at uh, how to actually construct a, a conformal classification model instead. And we're going to start off with basically uh, the same premise here that we uh, have a training set Z of T. Uh, of course, the only difference here is that instead of the Y's being on the real line, we have some discrete set of possible uh, labels in, in the classification context. Uh, we again have this calibration set that's independently sampled uh, from, from our uh, sampled space. Uh, and again, we have a non-conformity function. Now, this non-conformity function looks different from what we had before because, of course, absolute error isn't particularly meaningful uh, when we're talking about classification problems. So instead, we have uh, sort of an anonymous uh, non-conformity function here. We we'll just call it uh, delta. So it's some function that measures uh, the difference between a classification prediction and a class label. Uh, there's sort of two reasons for uh, having this anonymous function here. Um, or maybe really one reason, and that's in uh, classification, we're much more free in how we actually choose the non-conformity function compared to regression. I will briefly at least touch on the details about why that is uh, later on. Uh, but suffice to say here that, for, again, for classification, our non-conformity function it can, like, we have much greater freedom in what particular function we choose to use. Uh, typically, it's going to be some function that acts on uh, probability estimates generated by H. So we make a prediction, not just the most likely class label, but rather we make a prediction that generates probability estimates for each uh, class label or each, each possible class label in Y. And then our non-conformity function is going to be some measure on those probability estimates that determines uh, how far that prediction is from the particular uh, correct output for, for our uh, uh, object x of i here. Uh, now we'll have a very similar or pretty much the exact same process in, in how we actually use this to these tools. Uh, to construct a conformal uh, classification model. So we're, we're start by training classification model rather than a, a regression model on uh, our data uh, Z of T. Uh, with this model H instantiated, uh, given of course some, some choice of, of delta function, uh, we can also apply F of Z to each element in our calibration set. And, again, obtain these uh, non-conformity scores, alpha one through alpha Q, that we sort in descending order. Uh, so we have the exact same image uh, as we did in the regression case. The only difference here is essentially what function and what objects generated these, uh, these alpha values, 0 0.12, 0 0.08, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we can still make these types of assertions, uh, such as, well, the, the, the probability that our non-conformity uh, function would generate uh, a score greater than or equal to 0 0.12 is 0 0.2. Um, but how do we actually use this uh, information in a meaningful way 
given that uh, it's not meaningful for us to try to construct some sign, some sort of interval uh, necessarily based on these uh, these assertions. Uh, so in, in a classification context, given that we have uh, all of the necessary uh, components for being able to make these assertions with respect to our uh, non-conformity function, we need to do some slightly more involved statistical inference compared to the uh, regression case. But ho hopefully you'll, you'll be able to uh, follow along with what's uh, actually going on here. Uh, so first we, we make uh, or uh, make note of the fact that if we assume that all of these uh, objects uh, z1 through z k plus 1, if those are all drawn from the same distribution q, then the non-conformity scores, so the outputs of our non-conformity function for these objects, they are all going to be drawn from the same distribution A. So we have our function, our non-conformity function, that's essentially a funnel. Uh, we input things according to some distribution and then uh, whatever falls out of our funnel is going to follow some other distribution. Uh, but um, what we can say is that well, if uh, if we know that all of the inputs come from one particular distribution, then the outputs will also come from one other particular distribution. Uh, so with this sort of knowledge, we can uh, do some, some, some little bit tricky business here. So we start by postulating a label. Uh, so for our test object xk plus one, we'll basically say, well, what if xk plus one has the class label y tilde k plus one? What if, uh, it, it, what if that would be the true class label for our test object? So now we have some sort of tentative uh, z object here, z tilde, which is our, uh, the sort of, true inputs that we are interested in and our sort of guessed or postulated class label. Uh, and then according to point one and two here on this slide that we, we have this relationship between the distributions Q and A, well then we can say that if Z of K plus one or Z tilde K plus one rather, if that is distributed according to the distribution Q, then it must be the case that the output of applying the non-conformity function to that object is going to be distributed according to A. So if I assigned the correct class label to my object, then there's going to be a relationship between uh, the inputs of that object and the outputs of that object. And that relationship is expressed through the distributions Q and A, or there, there's going to be a predictable relationship, I should say. Uh, and then what we can say is essentially that, well, if, if the, our postulated label uh, Y tilde is equal to the correct class label uh, Y, uh, then we have access to this uh, uh, probability function uh, expressed through our empirical uh, cumulative distribution function. Um, so we can use this in the, the same way that we did in the regression case uh, and sort of assign uh, actual probabilities to, uh, to things. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to the details after this next point here as well. Um, the, the key here is that if we reject this y tilde label, uh, then if we know the values for uh, alpha y tilde and we know the values for alpha one through alpha q, we also know the false uh, negative probability of making this rejection. Uh, and 
to sort of illustrate here, uh, if we assume that whatever value is generated uh, for, our, uh, for f of z tilde, if that's uh, greater than alpha 10, but it's smaller than alpha 11, and then q is 99. So we have uh, 99 examples in our calibration set. Our, the nonconformity function or nonconformity score for this uh, z tilde is smaller than uh, 90 of those, or uh, yeah, 90 of those. That basically means that we've observed an event that has a probability of uh, 0.1 or 10%, which means if we reject that class label, uh, we will only have rejected at most 10% uh, of correct class labels in that case. Uh, so what kind of makes this thing a bit involved is that we're, what we're actually dealing with here is uh, p-value statistics. And this is just really based on hypothesis testing. So we're seeing a certain event and we know the probability of that event occurring given that whatever observation we're making actually belongs to whatever distribution we're considering. Uh, and if we consider uh, what we're observing to be a rare event given our distribution, then we can reject uh, our hypothesis, our hypothesis being Y tilde, and we have knowledge about uh, the likelihood of actually incorrectly rejecting uh, the hypothesis given uh, these p-values. Uh, so in order to actually again, construct an actual classification model based on, on this type of reasoning. Uh, we'll again start off the same way where we have our training set that we divide in a proper training set and a calibration set. Uh, we train our classification model, H, on the training set, and we apply the nonconformity function using H on our calibration set. Uh, and the prediction procedure then, uh, we generate for each possible sort of candidate class label, uh, we generate one of these alpha values or nonconformity scores. So basically, we, we take all of the possible uh, labels, we assign that label to our object, and we compute the function f given our tentatively labeled object and we get uh, this nonconformity score alpha uh, y tilde. So we'll have one uh, nonconformity score for our test object per possible class uh, in our problem space. And then what we'll do is we'll use these, uh, these uh, nonconformity scores for the test object to actually compute a p-value. So what happens here is uh, much or very similar to, to what we saw in, in the uh, empirical cumulative distribution function or version of this whole process. We're comparing the nonconformity score of our test tentatively labeled test object to the nonconformity scores in our calibration set. Uh, and basically what happens here is if uh, this alpha y tilde is very uh, small, uh, so we have a low nonconformity score for our test object, uh, then we'll end up with a large p-value. So basically what we're saying is if alpha y tilde is small, then this is a pretty common event. And conversely, if uh, alpha y of tilde is very large, uh, then we'll end up with a small p-value. So then we're saying if alpha y of tilde is very large, then we're seeing uh, a rare event. And the p-value that we're generating through this equation is going to be some uh, uniformly distributed value in the interval 0 to 1. Uh, and this ties into uh, 
uh, or actually I should say this is going to be uniformly distributed in 0 0.1 given uh, that y tilde is equal to the correct output. So if y tilde is the correct class for our test object, then the p-value will be uh, distributed uniformly on the interval zero, point, uh, 0 to 1, which means it's fairly easy for us to actually uh, execute the hypothesis testing procedure. Because if we know that we have this uniform variable and we say that, for instance, we make a cutoff at 0 0.2, well, uh, 0 0.2 or 20% of all p-values for correctly labeled objects are gonna be less than 0 0.2. So if we reject all of the uh, labels with p-values less than or equal to two, then our error probability is going to be 20%. So we have this very nice relationship between what the p-value is and uh, the probability that we're incorrectly rejecting the, the correct class label. Uh, and we, this is what we use when we construct this prediction interval for, the, uh, for our classification object. We construct our prediction region gamma by simply just including all of the uh, class labels for which uh, the computed p-value was greater than epsilon. And epsilon again is our desired uh, error probability for our conformal classifier. Uh, so that's how we actually construct uh, a conformal classification model. So we've seen how we construct a classification model and a regression model. Hopefully we've, we have some intuition for why this whole process works in, in the first place. And now we'll look into some uh, uh, some assumptions that we're making. So when does conformal prediction actually work and uh, how do we uh, evaluate conformal predictors in a meaningful way? Uh, so first, just some, some sort of requirements for when does conformal prediction actually work? Uh, first, we, we make this assumption about the data being drawn from the distribution Q. Now, interestingly here, uh, we were dealing with essentially three different sets of data. We had the, the training data, or what we call the, the proper training set, which is what we used to train our model H. We had the calibration set, and then of course we have our test data. Now, uh, we need uh, our calibration data and our test data to be drawn from the same distribution, we don't really need that the training data, the proper training set is drawn from the same distribution, uh, which is interesting and quite useful actually, because that means that we can use things like uh, SMOTE, for instance, uh, for our training data and maybe improve the sort of predictor pr pr predictive performance of H. Uh, as long as we don't do the same things for the calibration data, then we'll still end up with a valid conformal predictor. So whatever we do with the training data is not really gonna affect the, the validity of the uh, conformal prediction procedure. Uh, notably, we don't assume that we have statistical independence between uh, uh, observations. Uh, instead, what we expect is that we have this property called exchangeability. Uh, which is essentially saying that we expect the, the data sequence that we're uh, modeling to be stationary or time independent. Not necessarily completely true, but uh, that's essentially what it means. Uh, in, in practice, what exchangeability means is, uh, like I mentioned before, um, we expect that given a sequence of observations, uh, the, the probability of making that sequence of observations isn't dependent on what order we made those observations in. 
So this is uh, sort of where, where very similar ideas, at least with regards to stationarity or, or time independency of the sequence. Uh, we have we have to make this choice of a nonconformity function. Uh, we need to sort of instantiate f of z. Uh, in general, what function we choose to use, uh, that's not going to affect the validity of the conformal prediction procedure. So we're, we're very free in designing a prediction system uh, with, with respect to this, uh, this function f of z. And we can you know, play around and try many different ideas for what might work and what might not work. Uh, in practice, for specifically for regression problems, uh, what we want is essentially for f of z to be invertible, and we'll, we'll come back to that uh, in a short bit. But in general, uh, especially when we're talking about classification problems or maybe even beyond classification and regression, if we're talking about things like uh, anomaly detection or uh, change detection, uh, clustering, uh, other kinds of applications where we might use conformal prediction, then we're not really bound to using any specific nonconformity function. Uh, so, with regards to this uh, nonconformity function, then, okay, we say that choice of nonconformity function is not going to affect the validity of our conformal predictor. However, uh, if we want to maximize what we call informational efficiency, which is basically saying that we want to minimize the size of the prediction regions. Because of course, if, if we get predictions with uh, a high degree of confidence, saying it's 99% likely that this prediction region contains your uh, true output, if that prediction region is enormous, that doesn't really provide us with much information. So what we want to do is try to minimize the size of these prediction regions. And if we want to do that, uh, we generally want to have the property that uh, for any incorrectly labeled uh, object, so basically for an object that doesn't really belong to the, the distribution Q, then we want a high nonconformity value. And for any object that does belong to Q, so an object that seems uh, sort of normal or common, we want a low nonconformity score. So this is again why we call this a nonconformity function, because what we're really looking to is have a function that can rank objects based on how common or conforming they appear to be given a certain distribution or a certain a sample from a distribution. Uh, and then again, in order to minimize the computational cost in regression, so what we really want to try to avoid, of course, is having to enumerate uh, all the possible output values in, uh, on the real line, which is, uh, of course, impossible. Uh, what we want to do is uh, have an invertible uh, nonconformity function so specifically we want the inverse of f to generate y. This is sort of a, a, a half truth because there are ways of doing regression with conformal prediction without requiring that we have this uh, invertibility of the, the function. But in general, if we want to follow the, the, the specific process that I presented here, then we definitely need an invertible function uh, f. Uh, so, common choices for, for nonconformity functions. Um, I mentioned before that uh, with classification problems, and again, you know, if we're looking past classification and regression into other kinds of applications, uh, we're, we're generally relatively free in choosing our own nonconformity function. But a very common choice for classification problems specifically is to have a function that operates on the probability estimates of the underlying model H. Uh, so typically, 
we might have a function that says, take the, the probability estimate for uh, the correct output given our input, and then just let the nonconformity score be one minus that probability estimate. So if we get a high probability estimate for, uh, for the correct class label, then we'll have a no low nonconformity score. And if we get a low probability estimate for the correct class label, we'll have a high uh, nonconformity score. And again, for uh, nonconformity or for, for, for regression problems, uh, we typically use the absolute error nonconformity function since that's partly invertible. Uh, the criteria that we use typically to evaluate conformal predictors are what we call validity and efficiency. And validity is the property of a conformal predictor that the empirical error rate that we, we're going to see for our model is going to correspond to epsilon. So we're going to have this nice coherence between expected uh, error rate and empirical error rate. And uh, this is automatically going to be guaranteed for a conformal predictor given that we've implemented the, the conformal predictor uh, appropriately. Uh, and this is a very important property of conformal prediction that this, uh, this quality of validity is, is actually automatic in the, in the process. Still might be interesting to uh, assess uh, empirical validity or empirical error rate of our conformal predictor. And specifically, if we're, if we're dealing with uh, problems of a sp uh, specific nature, we have um, unbalanced problems, for instance, uh, we might look into something that's called Mondrian or conditional conformal predictors. And then it's definitely interesting to, to assess the, the empirical validity of the conformal predictor. Uh, for this informational efficiency, again, this deals with the size of the prediction regions. How we measure this uh, depends a lot on the, the particular application that we're working with. Uh, you know, is it uh, classification, regression, other types of problems. Uh, and there's a huge array of different types of meaningful measures that we can use uh, to assess efficiency in a conformal predictor, uh, similar to what we would have for for classification or regression in general, we have you know, accuracy, precision, recall, blah 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 for for classification, and similar for regression, a whole bunch of different measures, and we have that here as well in the conformal prediction. Um, finally, a uh, note that's of course. Uh, quite important to make here. Uh, the this value epsilon that we're choosing, this is our sort of control mechanism for the error rate of the conformal predictor. So I say I want predictions that have there are uh, correct with a certain probability one minus epsilon. Uh, while I'm controlling this error rate epsilon, I'm implicitly simultaneously controlling uh, the size of the predictions that are generated by my conformal predictor. That's sort of the, the underlying mechanism that makes conformal prediction work is that if I say that I want to be more confident in my predictions, then the prediction regions will tend to grow. Uh, so typically, if we look at uh, these uh, uh, validity and efficiency uh, uh, criteria for conform uh, conformal predictor, uh, we would see that uh, the error rate, uh, which is the empirical ra ra rate being the red line here, uh, typically it's going to correspond very, very well to the expected uh, error rate, which is the dashed black line here. So as I'm increasing my significance level epsilon. So basically I'm accepting more erroneous predictions, the rate of uh, the empirical rate of uh, erroneous predictions rises in the same, at the same rate. And of course, what happens when I'm accepting uh, 
a greater uh, number of erroneous predictions is that my uh, predictor can make uh, smaller prediction regions on average. So again, a very important sort of consideration and trade-off to have in mind. Uh, so finally, we're, we're at the end of the presentation and I'm gonna leave you with some concluding thoughts here. Uh, so conformal predictors, uh, they provide us with statistically valid uh, confidence values uh, with each individual prediction that we're making. So every time we make a prediction, uh, we, we get a measure of confidence in that prediction and that um, confidence measure is statistically valid. And this validity is automatic. So the conformal predictor is going to be automatically well calibrated. Uh, again, regardless of what nonconformity function I'm using, I'm only really relying on the assumption of exchangeability. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, and that's also the really the only assumption that we're making. We're not making any uh, assumptions about IID. We're not expecting to know any uh, prior probabilities, et cetera, et cetera. We only uh, ask for this one thing in exchangeability. Uh, again, uh, it's simple to, to implement. Uh, it's relatively reason, uh, simple to reason about. There, there's, uh, especially if you're only dealing with uh, classification and regression problems, there's sort of uh, only a handful of uh, little components that you really need to uh, to think about. And uh, validating conformal predictors is also relatively simple. It's basically the same sort of procedure that would you would use for, for any uh, uh, normal classification or regression model, for instance. Uh, and uh, at least, of course, I'm a bit biased, but uh, conformal predictors are an excellent addition to your uh, machine learning toolbox, and especially in cases where you're dealing with high-risk applications. So if you're expecting that, given your particular application, making a bad prediction can lead to bad consequences, then having this measure of confidence in your prediction, telling you essentially to what degree you should trust the prediction is very, very useful. And that is it for me. Thank you very much.